Welcome. Thank you for joining us today to hear about the art collection at the Science Museum. I'm Anna Ferrari, the curator of art and visual culture at the Science Museum Group. And I'm Surya Boya, a doctoral student based at the Science Museum Group and Birkbeck University of London, researching the history of arts within the museum group. So an art collection is perhaps not what springs to mind immediately when you think of the Science Museum. And yet art has always been part of the museum's collections. So I want to take you back through the history of the Science Museum. Its origins go back to the Great Exhibition of 1851, which led to the establishment of the South Kensington Museum in 1857 on the site of today's Victoria and Albert Museum. This museum combined both art and science and technology collections. But in 1909, the science and engineering collections were separated from the V&A's art collections and it took the name of Science Museum. Although um, the art uh, collections remained at the v &A, the Science Museum retained portraits that formed a collection called the National Gallery of Portraits of Inventors, Discoverers, and Introducers of the Useful Arts. Over the following decades, the museum continued to acquire works of art, largely because they represented scientific or technological processes. But it wasn't until the 1970s that a collection called the Victorian Collection was formed and seen as a distinct um, collection in the museum. Um, uh, oh, um, a key shift came in the mid 1990s when the museum was about to launch into the redevelopment of a new wing. And the museum decided to make it its policy to embed contemporary art into each new project and committed to, I quote, integrate art within the development process for all major capital projects, both buildings and galleries. As you'll see, this has had a great impact on the Science Museum's approach to collecting. These different parts of the collection, so the pictorial collection and the contemporary strand, now form part of the Science Museum's art collection. And in the next few minutes, Surya and I want to give you a sense of the variety of the collection across different periods and media, and to suggest different ways in which art and science intersect in a museum, from evoking powerful images of industry to inviting and sometimes provoking visitors to reflect on the museum's collection. Here's the first artwork, Colbert Dale by Night, by Philip James de Lutherberg. When Abraham Darby successfully smelted iron using coke or roasted coal in 1709, he changed the course of history. Achieved at Colbrookdale in Shropshire, coke smelting reduced the cost of iron, ushering in a new industrial era. Philip James de Lutherberg's work in the theatre gave him experience of creating dramatic lighting effects. Here, Colbrookdale's glowing furnaces contrast the picturesque rural surroundings. The colour palette is extremely limited. There are no real greens, even though this is a landscape scene. Instead, the palette is monochromatic, almost metallic. It gives a sense of the industrial processes at the heart of the painting. At the right edge, the moon peeks out from behind a cloud, but the light it throws is feeble. Much stronger by comparison is the central blaze of the ironworks. Rutherberg has dabbed a little white paint onto the centre of the canvas and slowly built the light out from this central point. It's the same striking effect of light employed by Caravaggio in his religious scenes or by Joseph Wright of Derby in his so-called candlelight series of paintings. Wright's paintings, which show scientific experiments taking place by candlelight, have contributed to the common metaphor that the Enlightenment lit up the world. And here we see scientific progress taking physical, industrial form as it lights up the countryside. That white hot blaze in the centre of Lutherberg's canvas soaks the picture with an almost supernatural intensity that no normal illumination could hope to produce. But there's also something monstrous in the blaze of the ironworks. The contemporary writer Charles Dibdin was not alone when he likened the quote-unquote infernal Colebrookdale to hell. Even so, when contemporary commentators complained of the fiery horrors that the ironworks unleashed on the pastoral landscape, they at the same time often found themselves perversely attracted to the sublime clash of idyll 
and industry. Coburgdale had been an industrial center for almost 100 years by the time Lutherberg painted it in 1801. That sublime clash of idyll and industry which it staged so clearly meant that British landscape artists found it almost irresistible, particularly at a time when travel on the continent was limited by war. In this way, the painting captures the tension at the very heart of Britain's industrial growth. Should we fear or welcome industry or both? And because it lacks details of that smelting process in the ironworks, the artwork caused debate when the museum acquired it. However, the director of the museum at the time, in 1952, a man called Frank Sherwood Taylor, believed it would quote unquote, fire the imagination. It's become a celebrated symbol of British industry. It's been used for many book covers and it's often been loaned out for exhibitions at other institutions around the world. So Surya has just discussed how Colebrookdale participated in creating an image of a new industrial process. So how art can represent new knowledge and techniques. I now want to talk to you about a group of 19th century watercolors that was part of uh, the process of creating this new scientific knowledge. So in this case, the watercolors were painted in part by Luke Howard, who devised a new cloud classification. Howard was man of the 18th century. He was born in 1772 and he trained as a pharmacist. But his real passion really was studying the weather. And he devoted his life to uh, meticulously recording the weather and in particular focusing on clouds. Um, until the 1800s, there was no consistent way of describing and categorizing clouds. And they were ever changing forms, they were described in poetic terms rather than scientifically classified into different types. But all this changed in 1802 when Howard proposed a classification of clouds based on his observations and his watercolors uh, painted while traveling between London and the Lake District. And he published his classification in his essay on the modification of clouds. And in this essay, he distinguished three main cloud modifications or cloud structures, if you want, to which he gave Latin names. So there was the, the cirrus, meaning curl of hair, and the cumulus for heap, and the stratus for layer. And when Howard came to publish a new edition of his essay in 1865, these four works you see here were reproduced as engravings to illustrate the different cloud structures. Now, there's some uncertainty about who Howard collaborated with to make these watercolors. Um, the landscapes may have been painted by Edward Kenyon or his son, Charles John Kenyon, both of whom were landscape painters. But these are picturesque landscapes um, with charming small figures um, and cows populating the foreground, um, evoking a bucolic vision of Britain and the painter has also used the traditional formal device of the, the repoussoir or painting trees um, in the foreground to frame the landscape and create the illusion of depth with the clouds in the distance. With Latin still widely studied and uh, used in international scholarly circles, Howard's cloud names became widespread and in fact are still used today. They were widely influential in the arts at the time as well. And they earned him, Howard, the admiration of poets like Goethe and Shelley, uh, each of whom dedicated poems to his cloud classification. And these romantic sketches of cloud formations sweeping across open skies have also been linked to John Constable's series of cloud studies from the early 1820s. And we know that Constable owned a book on meteorology, which included a chapter about Howard's classification and that at some point Constable annotated this chapter heavily. So these works show a different relationship with science, less illustrative and more part of the working process of Howard um, as he conveyed his new um, classification. But they also reflect um, the tradition of painting landscapes in the 19th century. During the First World War, conscription reduced the number of working men in the UK. So women took on jobs that had previously been done mainly by men. Stanhope Forbes' oil painting, The Munition Girls, focuses on the heat, the dirt, 
and the controlled chaos inside a munitions factory. The rather skeletal press that we can see in the center of Forbes painting might seem ill-fitted to the production of four and a half inch shells. And that's because this press was originally designed to produce forged tires and axles for railway wagons. Shells were in particularly high demand on the Western Front. And so most metalworking production shifted to ammunition. Here, we can see the converted Kilnhurst Steelworks of John Baker and Company in Rotherham. Shells were in such high demand that the then Minister of Munitions, one Winston Churchill, described the conflict as a steel war. South Yorkshire's iron and steel industry was almost entirely turned over to military needs. And by the end of the war, 40,000 women were employed in the UK steel industry, up from only 6,000 before the war. And they now represented 11% of the total workforce. Forbes is usually remembered for his idyllic rural realist paintings of people in traditional industries like fishing and farming. He was for a very long time based in West Cornwall, an area which often formed the location for his works. In Cornwall, Forbes was called the father of the Newland School of Painters, and he also founded a very influential art school in the area. The Munition Girls marks a shift in his practice, as from World War I onward, increasingly he considered industrial subjects. The painting was commissioned by the managing director of the Kilnhurst Steelworks, who intended it as a memento for the workers. Each of the women received a frame copy of it. Forbes exhibited at the Royal Academy in London from 1878 onward, and in 1910 was elected an academician. Munition Goals was itself exhibited at the Royal Academy's summer exhibition in 1919, and it caused an uproar amongst some visitors who were shocked to see women in factory dress making weapons. Forbes later said of his experience observing the women in the munitions factory, quote, it was indeed an unforgettable sight to see those fine women carrying on their work so splendidly. And the opportunity which Mr. Baker gave me to record this wonderful service is one which I can never be sufficiently grateful. 65 years later, after the museum acquired the painting, a group of these women steel workers were invited to attend the work's public unveiling. I like to think that they found themselves staring back at them from the canvas. So only a few years um, later, but in a radically different style, um, Edward Wadsworth uh, composed this starkly painted work um, and celebrated the sleek curves and abstract forms of a machine part, a ship's propeller. Wadsworth's background predisposed him to embracing what became known as the machine aesthetic. He was born in 1889 to a Yorkshire textile manufacturer and he was sent to study engineering draftsmanship in Munich in 1906. When he came back to Britain, he then attended the Slade School of Art. And then in the 1910s, he joined the Vorticist movement led by Wyndham Lewis, which championed the machine aesthetic, recognizing machines and industrial design as a source of beauty. So by the time Wadsworth painted this work, the machine aesthetic was a key strand of, of modernist art, spanning movements from French purism to American precisionism, as well as the functional forms of um, the Bauhaus school in Germany. Tellingly, in uh, 1934, the Museum of Modern Art in New York organized an exhibition called Machine Art, uh, celebrating the aesthetic qualities of machines. Um, which included propellers from boats and airplanes that were also illustrated in the catalogue in a way that's not dissimilar from, um, as you see in, in this painting, focusing on the machine part. So it's perhaps little surprise then that Wadsworth chose to represent a propeller in the 1930s when he was commissioned by the London Passenger Transport Board, today's Transport for London, to design posters promoting the South Kensington Museums of which the Science Museum is one. Um, with a predilection for marine um, subjects, um, Wadsworth drew on the Science Museum's own collections, choosing to depict um, a beautifully tactile wooden model of a propeller from a 19th century ship called the Napoleon, which you see here on the left. And you can see how Wadsworth really delighted in its abstracted and streamlined forms. And the wooden propeller 
uh, on the on the left is actually only about 25 centimeters in diameter but uh, painted from a close perspective and focusing on the bright propeller against a gray backdrop what's worth elevates the relatively humble object and turns it into an icon of modernism a small beautiful object standing in for the wealth of several South Kensington museums. Seventy years after Indian independence, the Science Museum hosted a season of exhibitions celebrating India's involvement in science. One of these was called Illuminating India, 5,000 Years of Science and Innovation. The exhibition showed that India has contributed extraordinary ideas that have changed the way that we understand the world today. The museum commissioned self-described Punjabi Liverpudlian artist Shaila Kumari Singh Berman to create works responding to objects and stories in the exhibition. Originally intended as a single large artwork, it became clear that the variety of Indian contributions to science demanded numerous responses. The project represents the artist's first extended engagement with the history of science and medicine. The works range across print, collage, photography, and mixed media, including experiments with iPad technology. They all hung together as a single salon style hang right at the entrance to the exhibition. Berman touches on many, many topics in these works. For instance, one of the works is a panchanga. Part calendar or almanac and part celestial forecast, the inclusion of this Hindu astrological document speaks to the fact that the methods of measurement used in astrology relate to science, even if other aspects of astrology are not typically considered science in the West. Another work titled 000 celebrates the first use of the number zero in Indian mathematics in at least the seventh century AD. And it's not an overstatement to say that the invention or discovery, depending on how you look at it, of zero revolutionized how we do mathematics. Elsewhere, Berman reproduces in fine gold leaf three Ayurvedic surgical tools from the Science Museum's Welcome Medical Collection. Ayurvedic medicine is an ancient Indian health system, one of the world's oldest, and it remains one of the most popular healthcare systems in the subcontinent existing alongside Western medicine. This is one of the 29 works created by Berman. Her practice often relies on acquiring seemingly ordinary everyday materials in bulk, such as plastic beads, fabric and wallpaper. We see the impact of that in this work, which is made from an inkjet print with added cotton fabric shapes, plastic beads, very fine plastic leaves, mirror pieces and peacock feathers. The artwork depicts Saraswati, the Hindu goddess of learning and wisdom, and therefore of science. She's also the goddess of art and music. You can see two of her four arms play a veena, which is one of the oldest string instruments in the world. In some Hindu traditions, the supreme goddess Parvati manifests as other goddesses, including Saraswati. In her commission, Berman references all the major religions originating in the Indian subcontinent. And this touches on a key point about Berman's artworks as well as the exhibition more widely. The notion of empiricism lies at the heart of Western science. However, in these works, we find an intermingling of empiricist knowledge with other forms of knowledge like Hindu astrology, Ayurveda and mythology. This apparent mixing of boundaries encourages us to look beyond the strict Western paradigm of empiricism toward non-Western cultures like India, where forms of scientific knowledge are also derived from other knowledge traditions besides empiricism. So as I mentioned earlier on, since the mid-1990s, contemporary art commissions have been part of the planning of new spaces at, and galleries at the Science Museum. So when the curatorial team started redeveloping the medicine galleries at the Science Museum in the 2010s, art commissions were really part of the vision and a new commission was uh, planned for each uh, gallery. The Faith, Hope and Fear Gallery looks at the wider social and cultural influences that impact our health from religious faith to reliance on the family and community. 
So really the many different ways people have made sense of their health over time and across cultures. In this gallery, the idea was to invite an artist to explore the topic of death and encourage visitors to pause and think about what makes a good death in the 21st century. Eleanor Crook is a sculptor with a deep interest in medicine, anatomy and mortality. Her background is in classics and archaeology, and she frequently works with medical museums. So she was really the ideal artist for this challenging commission. And she conceived uh, Santa Medicina, this work, a life-size bronze figure clothed in a richly brocaded dress. She's um, something of an imaginary patron saint of medicine. She's part saint, part surgeon. So the halo above her head is made from a surgeon's uh, head mirror. And the stethoscope around her neck becomes rosary beads. And in her hands, she holds a scalpel and sewing scissors as if she's performing an operation. Uh, Santa Medicina's skirts are drawn back to reveal a glass case like a reliquary. In it reclines a wax figure hovering between life and death in the patron saint's protective skirts. And Crook's ideas for this work really stemmed from early childhood memories. Um, so when she visited Innsbruck in Austria, and saw the court church. Um, she saw there the monumental bronze sculptures from the tomb of the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I. And this is a 16th century tomb, which is a vast installation, including 28 larger than life bronze figures wearing highly textured and decorated clothing. And uh, evoking this uh, long sculptural tradition, Santa Medicina's skirts is covered with medical amulets and votive emblems of the medical profession. Like for example, uh, Mercury's uh, staff with the two snakes intertwined, which you can see in the image on the lower left, or um, the 19th century uh, Chatelaine around uh, Santa Medicina's uh, waist, which belonged to a nurse and which is today in a historical uh, collection. And um, Crook also asked friends, colleagues, and the team at the Science Museum uh, for suggestions for votive amulets with personal significance. So for example, um, the twins in utero, uh, which you see in the lower left-hand side, were chosen by my uh, colleague, Natasha McEnroe, who is the keeper of medicine, and who chose this for her twins. Um, on the uh, right on the skirts, you can see that they're peacock feathers in the skirt, and those were chosen by another colleague to allude to the cultural significance of the peacock in Indian culture. So it's a sculpture which invites a personal engagement, uh, not least because it's a sculpture that's intended to be uh, touched, but it's also a work with a, a rich uh, personal significance that offers uh, different entry points as it renders and as it resonates widely with um, the history of medicine as well as the history of art. So we've reached the end of this whistle stop tour around some of the highlights of the Science Museum's art collection. But today we've only been able to really scratch at the surface of what we have on offer at the museum. As an institution, as you've seen, we've been collecting and commissioning artworks since our very earliest beginnings in the 1850s leading to a collection that includes over 9,000 works of art. We have a mix of historical works and contemporary art, all linked in some way to science, technology or medicine. Today we've seen how art can present vivid representations of industry, as in Luther Berg's Colbert Dale by Night and Forbes's Munition Girls. We've seen how science can be done with or through art, as in the case of Howard's Cloud Studies. And we've seen how contemporary artists such as Shyla Berman and Eleanor Crook have found it productive to reflect on questions raised by science, technology and medicine within their own artistic practices. But there are so many artists whose works we hold in the collection that we sadly haven't had time to talk about today, including Joseph Wright of Derby, Jacob Epstein, Barbara Hepworth, Eduardo Palozzi, Anthony Gormley, Cornelia Parker, Grayson Perry, Mark Quinn, the list goes on. So please come and visit us to see more of our world leading collection. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to Art UK and Bloomberg Philanthropies for making this Art Unlocked series possible.